But since the movie uh, was completed, Thomas uh, went to the VA with a swollen right arm, and it hurt, and they gave him pain pills. And several days later, he was discovered in bed in a coma. Uh, Thomas sustained a pulmonary embolism, which as you know means uh, oxygen deprivation to the brain. So Thomas now struggles to speak. His, his speech is somewhat impaired, but you can understand it. It, uh, it becomes less and less crisp as the day goes on, as fatigue sets in. He also uh, lost his ability, his opposable thumb dexterity. So he, has, he can't hold silverware. He has to be fed. He recently had a colostomy, a heroic surgery, which puts the bag on the outside of the body, and uh, he awakened from the surgery that he really hoped that this was going to relieve the significant discomfort that he'd been sustaining. This is awful. I mean, the closer you get to this, it just blows you back. And all I can think of is Bush saying, bring it on. It's a, this is a classic example of what you can do if you frighten a nation. A smoking gun. It's amazing what you can do. Um, he, he decided, he called me on a Saturday morning and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get off Nutrient and I will allow myself to go away, as he put it. He was going to purposely end his life. Subsequent to that, I believe, to, uh, I don't know what he'll be able to say. By the way, I'm told he's not well at all. We'll see Claudia and I hope we'll see uh, Thomas. Uh, Tom Morello went to Kansas City to do a concert for Thomas in Kansas City, which of course Thomas would be on the stage. And Thomas couldn't go across town to the venue for this concert. So that's how, this is how his life is going. Um, I'm trying to think what else you need to know. I, don't, I guess that's all. Uh, let's, uh, by the way, Thomas is, now has, Thomas's wife, second wife, whom you'll meet here in a moment. Her name is Claudia, and she's been with Thomas over, I think, seven years now, maybe eight. She's, this is a love story. She's a fabulous young woman, and she cares for Thomas. Uh, and Thomas said he wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for her. And we're about to meet her. So how close are we? Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so tell me, uh, you're alone. Where? Uh, tell me about Thomas right now. Uh, well, depending on the day, uh, because of the pain medicine, and he's tired, and he goes through different stages during the day where he's either awake or tired. So um, he's really tired today. And so we're not going to meet him. Uh, he he asked that I take his place and. I said I would. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we're, we'll, we'll, um, can you give us just a, a, a kind of an idea of, about what his condition is now or how he's been doing and you've just moved to Portland, Oregon. Tell me about this. Is it, are you glad you did this? Um, uh, let me think about that for a second. We, um, I mean, Kansas City was fine, but he had always dreamed of moving out to the Pacific Northwest after he uh, served in the Army and got his GI Bill, so coming out here was always a dream for him, and then it got complicated, of course, so, uh, and we got sick last year, and so there's a certain point where he was stabilized with his pain and with his pain medicine, and we felt kind of bored, and we thought, well, um, why not give it a try? And he he's he wanted to come, so I said, well, why not? So uh, everything kind of came together in late August, and we're here, and we're excited about um, uh, getting involved and and, and, and getting out and, and 
having new experiences and, and stuff like that. Do you feel that the, the VA is more hands-on out there? Yeah, it's been a totally different experience. I mean, it's just strange. You know, we felt um, that the care was pretty substandard at the Kansas City VA, and we had transitioned to hospice to kind of get away from the VA because we felt under underserved. Um, and now uh, the system here is very accommodating. They have at-home visits, and uh, they've gone out of their way to accommodate Thomas uh, in whatever he needs. So it's been a very, very positive, uplifting experience back to the VA. Um, it's just totally, it's a di completely different universe, actually. And how is this, is, is how much discomfort now? Uh, well, we're stabilized with pain, and we're at home, and I guess compared to last year before we started having to go to the hospital, we used to go out and go to the movies and go out to eat and go out to concerts, but uh, he's mostly better than it, and we try to get out maybe, try to get out at least once a week, but, you know, the medicine makes him really tired, so once he gets up in the chair, it's exhausting even in the chair. So uh, his energy level is a lot lower, um, but we're trying to kind of, uh, and here it's easy to, like, where we lived in Kansas City, we were just in, like, a subdivision, and there was, you know, we'd have to drive a distance to go anywhere interesting. So we're in the thick of it here, and there's, you know, music and uh, movie theaters just within a couple blocks distance from where we live, and the Portland Art Museum, and a lot of great things culturally, so we feel like we have more of an opportunity to enjoy things here, um, based on our situation. Right. Now, it wasn't that long ago that he, he notified me that he was choosing to end his life. Uh, obviously, he's backed up from that decision. Does he, do you see a, a new, a renewed interest in his living? Yeah, it's like uh, in Kansas City, it's almost like we're kind of uh, feeling like we're just waiting to die. We're just kind of, it was, there's nothing really going on there. And so we've come out here to maybe start a new life. And uh, again, he's stable enough where we're trying, but it is still a greater challenge than ever to get him up and out. So um, we do have, we feel excited and encouraged by being in a place like Portland, um, but there's still challenges we have to work with to uh, work with his level of exhaustion on a daily basis and all mm -hmm. medicine and we have to do breathing treatments and that. Right. Um, Try. Right. Um, you, had, you were visited by ABC's Nightline, right? Uh, yeah, actually, Martha Raddatz, uh, she wrote a book called uh, The Long Road Home, um, and it was about the, the mission on April 4th that Thomas was on. And April, 4th, was such, uh, April 4th of 2004. 2004. Um, so she had uh, visited with Robert, Sergeant Robert Milton Berger, who was the, I guess, the platoon leader that rescued him and told him that he'd be fine and that he wasn't, that he wasn't going to be paralyzed, and so all this time he had felt guilty that he ended up being paralyzed, and so it was kind of, um, she had interviewed him over the years, and we got contacted after he made the decision, and so they were going to come early in the spring, and then they ended up coming out here to Portland. He came with his wife, and it was a really lovely meeting, actually, it was um, a good meeting for them, and good for the wives to get together, and it's, uh, so that's going to be aired like December 13th or something they've said so far. Yeah, that is Nightline, is it? Um, I think it's the evening, ABC Evening News, I think. Because uh, uh, Miranda's a foreign, the, you know, right, the yes. Mideast Midi correspondent. Very good, December 15th. Yeah. But this soldier was on the truck, is that so, with Thomas? Yeah, he was. Um, you know, we got more into the story. I heard the story from Thomas many times, but we got, I felt like I got a lot of details filled in. So uh, when he was shot, he immediately started to look for like wounds and you know the bullet entry and exit wounds. And he could only find the one by the knee, so he didn't find anything by his chest. So he just said, you know, you're going to be fine. And I'm going to be paralyzed. And Thomas, you know, could feel that something terrible had happened. So he honestly didn't, 
he we would have never imagined that he ended up, you know, get becoming paralyzed. So it was just um, he felt guilty. Was, he felt guilty, did he? This this uh, was he a sergeant? What was his rank? I don't know. Yes, sergeant, sergeant Robert Miltenberger. Um, okay. I, you know, he I think he'd gone through a lot of feelings, and then he'd seen what happened to Thomas, and he'd gone through his own struggles with PTSD after returning home and trying to readjust. And uh, so it's been a long road for him, too, more on the maybe PTSD psychological side. So it was like, you know, he was more the, the, the psychological wounds and Thomas was, you know, more of the, right. the physical side. And but you have to wonder how many other relationships like that, you know, many of them agony-like come out of a war situation where if I had done this, if I had done that, I could save him, I could have, I would have, I should have. And it's a feature of war that is lar largely unexamined. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's impossible to imagine. Um, I mean, I, of course, grew up in this Vietnam movie, so I have a little understanding of what I think it might have been like, but to hear it directly from people who were there is, it's really profound and right. um, is there anybody with a question? I'm happy to we're happy to entertain you if you have a question for Claudia. Yes. What keeps her in this relationship? What is what? What keeps her in this relationship? What does she find in this relationship that with, sustains with, her? With Thomas? Yeah. What did you find in this in your relationship with Thomas that sustains you? People, you know, people are in awe at your, you are, uh, you are a uh, princess. I mean, you, your devotion to Thomas is more than remarkable. And how long have you been with Thomas now? It's, it's, it's it was five years in August. Five years. Yeah. And you met him, um, you met him in Chicago, where you live. I was in Chicago. I had done, I had, Spent a lot of time with Vietnam veterans and the National Vietnam Veterans Art Museum, where veterans create art that tells the story of war. So I had a lot of uh, really great teachers there. You know, I, I felt like those combat veterans from Vietnam were like historians. They were like teachers. You know, they've been through. You know, they've been to hell and back. So uh, when I heard about the movie, I saw the screening when you came to Chicago, like that April or May of two thousand eight. And I just felt like maybe for the first time, someone from this generation really stood up against the administration. And I felt like he was the first one to have the feelings that I had about what was happening. Because um, I felt like there wasn't enough of that, especially in the media at the time. So when uh, in August, uh, Eddie Vedder came to do a solo show, and then uh, I found out he was there, and I went to see him. and. Um, at, before I met him, I had totally given up on relationships. I, I, I was really hurt, and I felt like relationships were really limiting, and I had to give up a lot of who I was to be in a relationship. So I was kind of out of the game, so to speak. And then I met him, and you know, I said I, I said I was done, and I would never give anybody a chance. And I walked in, and I, I looked into his eyes for one moment, and you know, it was over. So. Uh, we became friends, and it was a it was a different kind of relationship because it wasn't. I feel like everything starts out so aggressively physical, and then you get to know someone, and it's it's a mess. So with him, it was like the opposite. Like we just got to know each other as people, and we found out we had all the same interests, and uh, it was wonderful to bond on music and movies and, and politics, and you know we both love Overman and. Um, we were following the election, and, and we were really excited about, you know, the change in the country at the time. So it was, uh, it was quite magical, actually. So I, when you meet the person that, when you look in their eyes and you know, like, you know, there's no escaping it, and you just have to take the ride. And he has been so supportive of me as a human being, which is unusual. So he has never held me back or looked at me. He's been. He's allowed me to be myself, which has never happened in a relationship. So um, he accepts me for who I am totally, and you know, I, he's and he, because of his extreme experience in war, like um, he has kind of this level of clarity and this patience, and I mean, he's a very special person. So um, he's, 
Yeah, I, uh, you, he's, he's, the, he's the guy. You're a Buddhist. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, I study Buddhism. Um, yeah. And he's an atheist. He's... <laughs> so how's that going? Yeah. Um, well, uh, he... Like, we respect each other's views, so it, it doesn't matter. Like, I understand where he's coming from, and he, he sees how important, like, me studying Buddhism is to me, so we're cool with it, and it's, you know, it's not a problem. Um, yeah, tell us, just give us your um, eyewitness views and feelings about the VA, and the, just generally how the soldier is treated today? Well, like I said before, coming from the Kansas City system, there seems to be a huge disparity between regional systems, which is unfortunate because, you know, we're probably get, we're getting much better care here, but then I feel sad for the guys in Kansas City that get stuck with maybe not so good care. So, there, it's not a very uniform system. And, um, I mean, again, we've been treated really well here, so it's like a totally, it's totally different than what we went through in Kansas City. I mean, we just wanted to get out of the Kansas City system, and it's, I don't know if it was the culture or, you know, the attitude or just, I'm not sure. I mean, we just got stuck in a bad, if you're stuck in a bad system, you have no options. So we had to move to a completely different state and region to get better care. I don't think that's really fair to veterans if they have limited options. Uh, hold on here. Anybody with a question? Sure. So do, do you feel we're six years into uh, the Obama administration, and uh, do you feel there's been any real change or, you know, uh, what's been going on? Uh, well, we, Thomas and I met during the election, and we had a lot of high hopes. And it felt like anything was possible at the time. Now, I mean, we see the realities of the baggage that was left over by the previous administration, A, and B, how kind of, how much work it takes to do anything if there was opposing forces within the same government. You know, it just looks like a circus. I mean, he wants to do good things and they won't let him. So, you know, what's, what, it's, he's like holding the space until the next thing. So it's disappointing. Um, you know, he's doing the best he can under the circumstances, I guess. I mean, and we'd hope for more, but if they're going to block him at every turn, then I guess there's nothing to do until the next, the next presidency. But you are getting out of the house more than you did in Kansas City, is that right? We are. We, um, uh, there's, we we're able to, again, cook out the door, and it's kind of, we can go down to the park, and there's shopping nearby, and it's, it's much more accessible. For our situation, than having to drive everywhere since coming Where's the man with the mic? You have to come down the aisle so they can. Oh, you got one. Go ahead. I I wanted to ask you, uh, Claudia. I'm I'm just so impressed with you. I mean, I can see the love in your face for Thomas, and I I wanted to ask if your experience with Thomas, loving him, caring for him, being with him through all he's going through, how it, uh, how it affects your understanding of Buddhism? Well, um, before Thomas, when I studied Buddhism and the understanding of like suffering is real, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really, it was conceptual, um, but being in the presence of someone who suffers immeasurably in that way and has, still has patience and uh, has a, such a genteel way of handling things. I don't know how he does it, you know? Again, it comes from near-death experience, I think, also. So if in Buddhism, death is real and suffering is real, then it's like I have like this portal of experience through his suffering. So I've, even more than my experience with Vietnam veterans, which is really storytelling, I've had to really care for someone in the most intimate way. Um, I've had to take care of his wounds of war. So I see uh, 
the most grotesque, you know, result of what happens when we send young people to get slaughtered, right? So, um, I, I, I feel like I can learn from his, and it makes me appreciate life a lot more. So I think maybe I had frustrations or complaints or concerns about things before I met him that now are, you know, non-existent. I don't, because if I wake up and I can, I have free freedom to walk and use my extremities and I can do whatever I want, I'm the loveliest person to him. So things like traffic and weather and things are just, you know, inconsequential now. You know, the things I used to maybe talk about or complain about. So I readjusted my level of what it means uh, to appreciate life and, and to be quote unquote happy and satisfied and, and and to appreciate, you know, how lucky I am to, to just have the ability to walk. So, um, and I see how much he doesn't, he lets, he, he doesn't complain about it. I mean, it's just crazy. So I say, you know, I have nothing to complain about if he does something to complain about. So he's readjusting my perspective of reality and of suffering and, you know, the struggles of what it must be like, not only for us, but for so many in the same situation. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask Claudia, um, she said that she sees what is happening with the government when someone asks about how she feels about the president. And she says she sees he wants to do things and he cannot get it done because he's blocked. And I wondered what she thinks, we the people, how we could be more involved. We're supposed to live in a democracy. What what could we do to more be, be more demonstrative of our own wants and wishes as residents in this country to aid in furthering what seems to be some of the president's goals? Because I think the media can play a powerful role, and if we are out there, that that the electorate will the the politicians will respond. So I'm wondering what do you think we can do more of? Because I certainly think we can do more. Um, well, I think with the latest, uh, I guess, the uh, uh, de Blasio and McAuliffe, you know, there's like a, there's a change happening out there. And I think we're realizing we're more, it's not two sides anymore. I think we're, Americans are struggling. Um, we're more similar than different, and I think they just want to divide us and they can't do it anymore. Um, so I think as long as we get out there and vote and, and we get representatives who represent the will of the people all across the country, you know, not just in certain states, I mean, um, and I think as, then as a collective we can move forward because if we, we can't continue dividing, it's not working. Yeah. And I, I just think, I think we're more similar, you know, I don't think it's, I think we can look beyond Democrat, Republican, conservative, uh, liberal, I just think these words are, I don't know, kind of, we're Americans, right? And I think we're concerned about uh, alleviating the struggle of everyday people. I, I, I just think we're so, we're, we're close to moving forward together. I just think we've been divided for so long. We have a question in the audience, but Yes, I wondered what happened to Thomas's brother, Nathan? Um, Nathan is in New Mexico, and he has uh, his wife, uh, and they have a baby, and actually it's, she's a, a girl, Alexis, and they have another baby on the way. It's gonna be a boy, we just heard. So um, he started a new life in New Mexico with his wife, and they're doing really well, and um, yeah, I wish you could see them more, but, you know, I mean, they're just, they're a new family starting out, and they've got kids, so, you know, they're, they're doing really well. Thank you. Come on. Yes. Yes. Um, well, Claudia, we'll, we, um, we thank you for your time. I'm sorry that we couldn't, you know, everybody wanted to say hello to Thomas, obviously, after seeing his, his story, but, uh, we understand this. I mean, I told him about the Morello concert. You know, Morello brought the band concert to Kansas City and Thomas couldn't even go. I mean, that's how 
That's how much is this country prevents him from doing things he would have loved to do. I mean, every, every day is different, so he has good days and bad days, and we just kind of have to ride the wave how it comes, and uh, I'm getting more comfortable. I'd rather just do it with him, but I am so grateful that people are interested in seeing the movies, so I, I want to at least show appreciation in this way to let people know that we're grateful that they're interested in thinking about things, and we're going to think about how we can make this a... Uh, a better place, a better country for everybody. Well, on behalf of the audience, I thank you very much for your work. I'll see you next week.